In this and coming sections, we'll look even more closely at the cortical neural circuits that govern human thought, some of which realize the volitional control that we are primarily concerned with when we talk about free will. But volitional thinking and imagining are just one mode of human thought. There are also other modes of thinking that are not deliberative or top-down. Among these types of non-volitional thought are the spontaneously divergent or jumping around forms of thinking evident in dreaming and daydreaming, and also in the idea generation or brainstorming phase of creative thinking. Sometimes this kind of circuitry can dominate thinking excessively. An excessive amount of jumping around might include the incessant distractibility of ADHD, perhaps associated with an overly active exogenous attentional system. It might also include the associative jumble of schizophrenic thinking. If every thought hyperlinks to every other possible thought, it would be very hard to maintain a goal-directed train of thought as indeed happens in people who suffer from schizophrenia and other forms of disordered thinking. And at the other end of the spectrum of non-volitional thinking, we have cases where instead of having excessively divergent cognition, we instead have excessively convergent cognition. An example of this occurs in the case of the ruminations of a depressed person who returns again and again to thoughts about his or her own failings, slights against the self, and an inescapable dwelling on feelings about the self. In this obsession with aspects of the self, depression has some parallels to narcissism, except that the self, rather than being glorified or endlessly promoted, is endlessly reviled. Closely related would be other forms of non-volitional thought that dwell on some object other than the self, as in obsessive compulsive disorder or the sexual or romantic obsessions that lead to stalking or the obsessions related to threat and danger associated with various anxiety disorders. While the main focus in a course on free will should naturally be neural circuits associated with volitional top-down control, we have to acknowledge that free will or volition operates within an ecosystem or family of human thought processes, perhaps the majority of which are not volitional. Anyone who has fallen madly in love with someone else can attest to the fact that it is almost impossible to will oneself not to have obsessive thoughts about the person one adores. This might be regarded as a legitimate form of OCD, which ideally leads to the healthy outcome of family formation, but can go awry, as in the case of stalking. But many of the primary psychological torments of clinical populations, whether OCD, depression, or anxiety disorders, involve cases of non-volitional thoughts, in a sense, imposed on a person against their will. These non-volitional modes of cognition are generally present in every human brain, but within a certain range of function, they're not debilitating and even lead to healthy outcomes. For example, it is good to get involuntarily distracted by things that move suddenly in the environment because they might be important, but it's not good to get excessively and incessantly distracted as in ADHD. It's good to be forced, so to speak, to cognize about one's social errors and violations so that one can heal relationships and correct one's behavior, but it's not healthy to excessively ruminate on these things as occurs in depression. In healthy brains, the volitional modes of thinking that we will cover in the next section are not overwhelmed by the non-volitional modes of cognition that we're discussing here. Let's now look at the neural circuits that underlie non-volitional modes of thinking in the brain. A fantastic review of cortical circuitry appeared in 2016, shown here. I'll use the figures and ideas from this review article to help us better understand how volitional circuits function within a framework of bottom-up and top-down control of one's mind and body. Let's return to the image that we considered before of the cortex segmented into seven cortical regions where neural activity varies together. We can now look more closely at the main executive circuits that we considered before and try to understand them in greater detail. Let's compare this image with a finer level of analysis of the different networks that we mentioned covered in that review article. Let's first consider two non-volitional control circuits. The first of these is the neural circuit associated with the lilac color shown here on the left. This is the so-called ventral attentional network shown here on the right in light green. 
The ventral attentional network is a non-volitional circuit associated with shifting attention automatically to sudden motion and onsets in the environment. This circuitry is very important because it causes us to automatically orient to things of potential relevance to our survival, whether potential predators or potential prey. If the circuitry is too sensitive, one will constantly get distracted as occurs in ADHD. These authors regard the ventral attentional network to be part of a more general salience network that also includes the yellow circuitry shown here. Here we see the anterior cingulate cortex, or ACC, and the anterior insula, labeled here as AI. I have argued that the anterior cingulate is involved in error detection in the service of staying on task, but in this case, the ACC might be involved in detecting errors or deviations from the normal state of affairs that are worthy of reorienting one's attention. The anterior insula, also known as the operculum of the frontal lobe, is likely involved in interoception. Some people think that the two circuits, namely the ventral attentional network and the dorsal aspect of the cingulo opercular circuit, are really two sides of a single salience detection system that leads one to reorient one's attention or reorient what one is doing in a bottom-up way. Other people think that these are separate interacting circuits that detect different types of salience, perhaps associated with external world versus internal world processing. I think that the jury is still out on that one. The second non-volitional neural circuit that we will consider is the default mode network that we talked about in a previous section. Initially, people thought that the circuit was central to spontaneous internal thoughts, such as daydreaming or so-called mind-wandering, or else thoughts about oneself and others. Since then, the story has turned out to be more complex and more interesting because there are times when parts of the default mode network are invoked in the service of deliberative volitional thinking, especially in cases where one mentalizes about the mental states of others or projects oneself into an imagined future or in episodic memory retrieval. What all these processes have in common, whether volitional or non-volitional, is internal thinking not connected with events in the outside world. That is, they are not concerned directly with present perception of the real world outside of us, but involve an internal simulation that we might regard as imagination. The default mode network is central to imagination because many forms of imagination involve invoking memories in the service of simulating others' minds or one's own reactions in possible scenarios. The authors of the review article call it the default network, or DN, and dissect it into three sub-circuits. These are shown here in dark blue, light blue, and purple. They call the dark blue subcircuit the default network core. It functions as a hub for internal simulation and can invoke the light blue and purple circuits depending on the internal reality that is being simulated at any given time. Included in this dark blue circuit are these areas. On the medial side of the cortex, the posterior cingulate cortex, or PCC, and the anterior medial prefrontal cortex, or AMPFC. On the lateral side of the cortex, the default network core includes this part of the posterior inferior parietal lobule, or PIPL. Now let's consider another part of the default network, shown here in purple, which they call the default network medial temporal lobe circuit, or DNMTL. There's also a portion of this circuit in the posterior inferior parietal lobule, shown here as well as the circuitry of the medial temporal lobe, that is involved in placing oneself and one's actions in a representation of space in world coordinates, including retrosplenial cortex, or RSC, so-called because it sits behind the posterior portion, or splenium, of the corpus callosum, and the parahippocampal cortex, or PHC, as well as the hippocampal formation, or HF. Finally, there's a subnetwork of the default network that they call the default network subcomponent 3, or DN sub 3, shown in light blue here, which includes this more anterior portion of the inferior parietal lobule, or IPL, as well as this portion of the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, or DMPFC. Portions of the superior temporal gyrus, or lateral temporal cortex, labeled LTC here, portions of the temporal pole, or temporal polar cortex, labeled TPC here, and then a portion of the inferior frontal gyrus, labeled IFG here.
Whereas the purple circuitry appears to be involved in simulating the placement of oneself in space or moving through the space of an internally generated world, the light blue circuitry is involved in placing oneself in others' minds or their animacy. Note that the purple circuitry is also involved in the perception of oneself in the world as one navigates through it, whereas the light blue circuitry is centrally involved in the perception of biological motions, such as facial gestures. So the spatial and animacy circuitry of perception of external events can also subserve the processing of these types of information in internally generated or imagined worlds. In this section, we have discussed the neural circuits involved in human cognition that are non-volitional. In the next section, we'll go into greater depth concerning the neural basis of volition in the human cortex. After that, we'll discuss how volitional and non-volitional modes of processing interact in our brains and minds.